first fall convocation, welcome to Cal Poly. For our faculty and staff who have been away for the summer, welcome back. And to the faculty and staff who have been here through the summer finalizing activities from last academic year and preparing for our students to return this fall, welcome to the academic new year. <laughs> to our members of the community who are here today, we welcome you and we thank you for joining us and being a part of our community. I look forward to convocation every year because it means that we are on the verge of launching another year our students are soon to return in mass, and Cal Poly will be full of energy and curiosity. As fall was approaching, I can tell you that I have been filled with feelings of pride, excitement, and gratitude about Cal Poly. I've been filled with pride as the year approaches because when I met our new ASI officers at the swearing-in ceremony of our new city manager, I was inspired by their eagerness to serve, their willingness to engage, and their structured approach to an enhancing the experience of their fellow students. I watched them interact with folks like our mayor and our chief of police, and I can see the poise and the maturity that these leaders bring to our campus. I listened to them as they talked about the mentorship they received from leaders like Michelle Crawford, and I was reminded of just how much of an impact you all make on a daily basis. I am filled with excitement because when I've met new colleagues, I've been blown away by their professional experience, their ged dedication to their craft, and their excitement for their new environment. Colleagues like Dr. Tisha Roby, who's presented for national organizations like College Board, and Dr. Susan Chang, who recently joined us from Georgetown. These are just a few examples of the infusion of talented newcomers. Uh-oh. Lost my spot there, hold on, just <laughs> talented newcomers who bring with them a wealth of experiences that we will certainly benefit from. I've been filled with gratitude because as I look back on the year that passed, I can see hundreds of wins for our campus, our students, our faculty, and our staff. Wins like our Cal Poly partners' intentional work in helping address the challenges that many face by securing new and additional housing options that incoming faculty and staff can take advantage of. I can see teams that have flourished and delivered above and beyond expectations. I am filled with gratitude because I am surrounded by amazing people, that's you all, with unparalleled dedication and commitment. And I'm filled with hope because I see progress in key areas and key initiatives that have helped our campus to be a more welcoming and engaging environment for all people, regardless of their identities. It's because of you all that I am grateful, our Cal Poly community, collecti who collectively have provided a consistently excellent place for thousands and thousands of students to learn and grow. Now, I know that at some point our community will face some challenges, and we may momentarily lose sight of the hope in front of us. I know that we'll encounter disagreements, disappointments, and setbacks on goals we want to achieve. But I also know that we are a community that is truly committed to our greater purpose, that no matter what we face, we all feel a great sense of responsibility for being here on behalf of that true purpose, our students and their education. There would be no campus, no job, and no challenges to overcome if it were not for the students that we are all here to serve. So through any disagreement, disappointment, or hardship that may come our way, if we agree to keep our focus on our main purpose, I have no doubt that we will thrive. Last year at Convocation, we were all reminded, thank you, Drew Rishaw, that to take good care of ourselves and our well-being. Well, I have some good news for you. It turns out that according to the American Heart Association and many research articles, gratitude has actually proven to be beneficial 
to both our physical and mental well-being. Now, I'm not suggesting, suggesting that we all have to walk around pretending to be happy all the time. But I am suggesting that our outcomes are often tied to our choices. So when you can decide between feeling overwhelmed or feeling grateful, feeling disappointed or feeling resolved, feeling frustrated or feeling hopeful, I encourage you to choose the latter. Choose gratitude. Choose hope. In those moments of challenge, be reminded of the reasons that you have chosen Cal Poly and the successes that we've experienced together. Be willing to be the difference maker and bright spot that your fellow students, faculty, and staff need. So, here's to an even brighter future than our incredibly storied past. And now, I'm pleased to introduce our next four speakers. First is one of those students I was talking about earlier, our ASI president and business administration major, Ashley Spragans. Hello, distinguished guests. I am Ashley Spragans, and I serve as the ASI student body president. It is my honor to represent all 22,000 of our students, but even more of an honor to share an impact on their academic careers with you all. At Cal Poly, excellence is not just a standard, it's a culture, one that is built by the dedication and passion of the people in this room. We are in an exciting era of transformation and your role in this cannot be overstated. Your commitment and leadership shape our future, guiding us through significant transitions and a renewed focus on expanding opportunities. These changes are reshaping our university in ways that will leave a lasting impact. Reflecting on my journey, I'm reminded of Nelson Mandela's words, education is the most powerful weapon you can use to change the world. At Cal Poly, this rings true every day as our students actively tackle challenges and drive innovation with the knowledge they gain. Here, a testament to the exceptional environment that you create. As we navigate this transformative time, your dedication is integral in guiding us through these changes and shaping the future of Cal Poly, ensuring our students reach their fullest potential. In this moment of opportunity, let us celebrate your profound influence on our collective journey. Your unwavering support and commitment making a lasting difference, turning challenges into opportunities and helping us build a brighter future. Together, we are shaping Cal Poly with a future that remains a beacon of excellence, innovation, and impact. Let's continue to be the driving force behind this journey, ensuring that excellence remains our reality and guiding our students to success. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. And next, we have Tom Randall representing the CSU Employees Union. Tom? We are living in another era of protest. Decades of unfulfilled promise have culminated in this moment. The California State University is now internationally recognized for its unionization efforts. This recognition should not be a thing anyone fears. It should be something we embrace in this, a safe and nurturing place, because it will change this nation and, with hope, the world. Students made this moment possible. You will remember it started here at the CSU. Our students have collectively recognized they want to say in their future. Soon they must individually decide on how to define, value, and defend their labor as well as ours. They are entering an age that will be radically different than ever before, just as we have experienced in our own time. So it is up to us to prepare for that fast changing world, ready or not. Will we shape the world better than we left it? Or will students find a way to push it far beyond? Or will they wonder how the world just moved on? 
We have seen what missiles and drones carrying bombs can do in a faraway land and how they destroy good lives and hearts. Will we ponder a sky without buzzing in the air, supplanting bees with countless motors as natural fare? Will we dance with fingers in salute and find ourselves with little resolute? Perhaps the score will be settled in the scores we learn about ourselves, a world where people do not lose their best of all humanity. We may see hope in students as they see their futures in us. We may have left ourselves no other choice than do better from now on if any of us want to see a future better than now. Our educations are not free, but an education can free a mind to deduce fact from fiction, to live in the ideals of kind. We may wish these benefits can be had without contributions to the cause, but in a mere moment of weakness or inattention, all can be lost. Powerful groups are trying to undermine and weaken everything we have built here together to make illegal our thoughts and beliefs and to undo us from our good and honest deeds. Think less what 2% means, even if it returns 5 or 10, but more as the ultimate investment in ourselves and what we can easily do. Will our students carry with them the education learned from here? And will it be enough to make their dreams real without fear? Learn by doing is no mere motto. It adapts to the present. It forges the future. It embraces our world of change where truth and liberty rearrange. We must define freedom, bold yet true, with justice and real meaning for me and for you. Together we can build a world where infinite possibilities thrive. Your unions work each day advancing causes to arrive. Teddy Roosevelt once said, comparison is the thief of joy. I say you need to set the example for joy without compare and ensure this joy spreads far and wide. Here's our chance, listen to the future. The world is learning by watching us, but we are learned by doing. Thank you for our moment together. Thank you for those reminders, Tom, and thank you for your service. And next is Lisa Kawamura, representing the California Faculty Association. I'm gonna remove my mask so I don't get arrested. Union begins with you, with you. Hello, Cal Poly. Um, our, we are the only bargaining unit to have not incurred a 7.9% decrease in our budget. Do you know what that means for you all? That meant a 5% raise for 2023-2024 and a 5% raise for 24-25. All together, that compounds to a 10.25% raise. That is the largest raise that I've seen in the last 26 years here as a temporary employee. And that was all because we are the largest higher education union in the nation. And we led the largest strike in that largest university system last year. And you know what? We won. What did we win? We won 10.25% in just flat salary general increase. Um, I'm not sure that those in Long Beach or administration know what it is that we do in the classroom or our offices and labs, but let me tell you that 10.25% raise is not enough for all we do. We also got over a 20% raise for our lowest paid faculty. Faculty and lecture A, some of them got up to a 21% raise. That is huge. For some of our lecture Bs, they got over a 15% raise. That is huge, especially for those of us who make so little in this teaching system. We had a 67 increase, 67 percent increase in paid parental leave. We are a model for what this state is trying to do for parental leave. Let's hear it. Thank you, Camille O'Brien. 
We also want first-time contract language for faculty being interviewed or approached by campus police. We want gender-inclusive restrooms and lactation spaces. And we have the acknowledgement of 1 to 1,500 counselor to student ratio, which we have already met here at Cal Poly. The problem is, where do we put all of our counselors so that they can counsel all of our students? There is not enough space for that to happen. We also won the options for counselors to request a 10 or 12 month workload contract. That is also huge. We doubled the pay for our department chairs. That may sound like a lot, but it went from $80 to 160, and we still do not pay our department chairs enough. We also want specific language protecting faculty from unilateral course enrollment by management. That means if you've been teaching a course and it's been set at 24, I know most of you are more like, what, 36, 42, something like that. And you notice that your course caps have now, got, now gone up to 45. You tell us right away so that we can make a grievance about that so that you don't have to have this course creep happening year by year. And this is all because you came out. You stayed the course and you all showed that we are stronger together. My friends, the fight is not over. Full contract bargaining is on the horizon. The bargaining survey is set to launch before October 1st. And I'm proud to announce that I've been appointed as one of your bargaining chairs. So that's actually pretty awesome. You have, you have an ear to the bargaining team right here. But we have a lot of changes on the horizon and your union is right here to back you up. Quarter to semester, proposed integration with CSU Maritime, and the Chancellor's Office has released a draconian time, place, and manner policy that has some CSUs um, even making those policies more extreme. We were asked to bring our water bottles today to the CLA meeting so that we have less disposable waste. But on some campuses, you're not even allowed to bring a metal water bottle anymore. We need your voice because we are stronger together. And please remember that union begins with you. Thank you all. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you, too, for your service. And now, Chair of the Academic Senate, Jerusha Greenwood. I don't know about you, but I feel all fired up for my third shift when I go home tonight. Um, thanks, Lisa. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Hi. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Yeah. Uh, thank you, President Armstrong and Provost Jackson Elmore for the invitation to speak today. Uh, my name is Jerusha Greenwood. My pronouns are she, hers, and I'm a professor in the Experience Industry Management Department in the College of Agriculture, Food, and Environmental Sciences, and I am very honored to be starting my second term as the Cal Poly Academic Senate Chair. Um, I've been thinking a lot about change lately. I, I have teenagers, so um, it's an election year. Um, yeah. Uh, Register to vote. Um, real changes are happening here at Cal Poly. As a university community, we have front row seats to the growth and development of these precious, smart, promising human beings as they emerge into adulthood and prepare, prepare for their professions. We have the privilege to observe and contribute to their sometimes linear, sometimes nonlinear, and sometimes chaotic evolution. Change happens everywhere, always. I don't need to tell you that. It happens in our personal and professional lives, and we often can't control when or how it happens. Change is inevitable, scary, and disruptive. When change happens, we may fear the impact it will have on our identities, on our long-held and sometimes fiercely held beliefs and assumptions, our relationships, and the norms and ways of doing things we're used to. Coming to college is about change. When students apply here at Cal Poly, they're asked to choose a major. By doing so, they are envisioning their future. They establish a mission for themselves to achieve that vision, 
And as faculty, we help them define that mission by providing a curriculum with room to personalize as they learn by doing. We help guide their change. They also choose their extracurricular and co-curriculars, those activities supported by their academic programs and divisions like student affairs. They build their communities and their networks. They learn that these connections to each other, between their learning and their chosen profession, between having a vision and realizing it, are how we navigate change effectively. But change isn't an all or nothing, zero sum concept. Change is about making decisions about what to conserve and what to evolve. And those friction points exist. And we have to ask ourselves questions about how do we maintain our core our th authentic identities while we're also meeting the moment and succeeding. Margaret Wheatley found in her research that relationships and critical connections are necess necessary to support that change. Chaos, which happens when old structures break down and new patterns emerge, is an essential process for change that we need to engage because it can lead to creative and meaningful solutions. She found that change and chaos can't be navigated and that organizational success is impossible without transparent information sharing. Adrienne Marie Brown, in writing about change, said that adaptation and evolution depend upon critical, deep, authentic connections, a thread that can be tugged on for support and resilience. The way I see it, we here, the faculty, staff, and administration, provide the setting and foundation for those connections, for that resilient and for students um, to form um, their identities. A vision of that future, be it as students, foreign organizations is, according to Wheatley, an invisible field that binds us together, emerging from relationships and chaos and information. So, yep, I've been thinking about change a lot lately. I'm here at Cal Poly to do what I can to help those students found, um, form that foundation, even as I and as we are experiencing change in our own lives. It's my hope in the year ahead that we continue to support our students as they navigate the changes in front of them while also finding those authentic connections with each other that we can tug on for support and resilience as we move, maneuver through the changes before us here at Cal Poly. On behalf of the Academic Senate, Happy New Year and take care. Thank you, Jerusha, and thank you for your leadership. And now it is my honor to introduce Cal Poly's president, Jeffrey Armstrong, who will provide the university address. Hello, everyone. It's a great day to be a Mustang, isn't it? Well, thank you, Terrence, and thank you, Ashley, Tom, Lisa, and Jerusha for your remarks. Well, good afternoon and welcome, everyone. Welcome to Fall Convocation. I'd like to say a special welcome to all new faculty and staff. As I will say later this week in our big fall welcome to our new students, thank you for choosing Cal Poly. And I also want to say the same to everyone else. Thank you for choosing Cal Poly. Regardless of whether this is your third, 14th, 20th, or 56th fall convocation. And yes, I am referring to Bailey College Dean Emeritus, Phil Bailey. Let's pause and celebrate Phil. And let's all join in for a pre-applause for these amazing award winners down front that you're going to meet later. Congratulations. I'd like to acknowledge some public officials and other friends from the community who are with us here today in support of this great university and, of course, the Central Coast. So please hold your applause till the end. We have elected officials from the city of San Luis Obispo with us today. Mayor Erica Stewart, 
Council members Emily Francis, Jan Marks, Michelle Shoresman, as well as City Manager Whitney McDonald. Let's give them a big round of applause. And from the County of San Luis Obispo, we have 3rd District Supervisor Don Ortiz Leg and County Administrative Officer Matt Pontus. Let's give them a round of applause. We have some other important partners on the Central Coast with us today. Uh, please hold your applause till I get through this wonderful list. CEO of the San Luis Obispo Downtown Association, LaBrynn Harris. Cuesta College Superintendent and President, Jill Stearns. Slow Chamber President and CEO, Jim D'Antona. Diablo Canyon Power Plant Site Vice President, Adam Peck. And Visit Slow Cal President and CEO, Kathy Cartier. Let's give them a big round of applause. We have a few new leaders from Cal Poly that I would like to recognize. First, over to my left, is our new Senior Vice President for Administration and Finance, Allison Baird-James. Allison, please wave. I would like to introduce several other familiar faces, but they're in new roles. Interim Vice President for Student Affairs, Cindy Villa. <laughs> Vice President for Strategic Initiatives and Advocacy, and our lead for this potential integration of the Cal Maritime, Jessica Darren. <laughs> Interim Vice President for Information Technology and CIO, Allison Robison. Our Acting Vice President for University Personnel, Katherine Rummel. And then our Interim Dean for Liberal Arts, Kate Murphy. Let's give them a big round of applause. Well, finally, to my left, I would like to introduce my wife and best friend, Sharon, for her unwavering support. Let's give her a big round of applause. We're both so fortunate, blessed, and privileged to serve Cal Poly, and we are grateful to be here. And this is our 14th convocation. We've got a ways to go, Phil. Today is a day for re reflecting on past accomplishments and looking forward. We have much to celebrate but we're at a pivotal time for our university, a key pivotal time for our university. I want to acknowledge the hard work underway to set the stage for an even brighter future so that we can continue to serve even more students and help them become the successes in their personal and professional lives that they want to be. So please indulge me for just a few minutes as I list some of the university communities recent accomplishments. Last year we announced for the 31st year in a row Cal Poly was named the best public uh, for US News and then we were also for the first year named the best overall masters in the West. We hope to do as well this year but the announcement comes out next week so we'll wait. In addition, Cal Poly was ranked in the top 25 of all public universities in the United States by Forbes. And for the second year in a row, Cal Poly was one of 54 highest ranked five-star universities in the US by Money Magazine. And last, the most recent Wall Street Journal best salaries ranking ranked Cal Poly number 23 overall number six public in the U.S., and number two public in California. Please give yourselves a big round of applause for these accomplishments.
I'm also pleased to report that we've been designated a minority serving institution, an Asian American and Native American Pacific Islander serving institution, and an emerging Hispanic serving institution. We plan to be designated an HSI in just a few short years. These public recognitions are good news for Cal Poly, but even better news are the many accomplishments by our students, faculty, and staff, which you saw on the slideshow that was running before the convocation. Many of those accomplishments and beyond are supported by donors. So please join me in thanking our alumni, foundation board, advisory board, corporate partners, community members, and many here today who helped Cal Poly raise over $123 million this last year. As I move to the heart of my comments, I'd like to share something that happened during the service awards event on this stage this past year. An individual who will remain anonymous crossed the stage to shake my hand and took that moment to say, Thank you, Mr. President, for keeping us employed. I mention this not to claim credit. The credit belongs to everyone here as part of this university. These have been challenging years, and more challenges are coming. But so far, we've avoided reduced enrollment, layoffs, and other many painful choices faced by so many of our friends and colleagues elsewhere. Rather, I mention this moment of grace during the annual service awards to celebrate this individual for taking the time to express praise when none was expected or due. We should all live with our eyes open for opportunities to express gratitude, just like uh, Vice President uh, Harris alluded to earlier. With this moment of grace in mind, let's step back and ask, why are we all employ employed? Why do we have the privilege of serving at such a prestigious university? Well, the answer is we're here to change lives and families. I often say to audiences that the majority of students are not going to remember the president's name. They're not going to remember the dean. But they're going to remember the faculty or staff member who encouraged them, who pushed them during a time of struggle or helped them in a deep time of need. We see the results in our successful alumni in the return on investment I mentioned earlier. And I'm so pleased to say the return on investment for a student body that is better reflecting our state. This is largely due to increasing financial aid and scholarships. To be clear, increasing financial aid and scholarships allows students who previously, who could not afford to relocate to this destination campus the opportunity to choose Cal Poly, to say yes and participate with you, faculty and staff, in Learn By Doing, and then be that ready day one graduate. I think that deserves a big round of applause. Thank you for helping make this happen. I also want to thank all our supporters who are listening for helping make this happen. Again, as I mentioned earlier, this is a pivotal time. We can do better. We must do better. We must serve more students. As a, re as a result of our lack of capacity, we denied admission to over 31,000 qualified applicants this fall. 31,000. We must grow to increase capacity for Californians. Sustainable growth is essential to provide the resources to achieve our strategic priorities. Sustainable growth is essential for that purpose. That is very important to underscore. I also want to note that I underscore sustainable growth. Note that I used that phrase. Sustainability comes in different forms. Growth consistent with excellence for all California. Ashley talked about that culture of excellence. Faculty and staff success. 
and assuring that annual increases in fall headcount are eclipsed by available bed spaces on campus. That's a very important part of what we're doing. Now that I've set the stage, let's look at our strategic priorities and talk about how we will be successful. You see those on the slide uh, behind me. Enhancing a vibrant residential campus. Enhancing student success. Increasing support for the teacher-scholar model. Creating a rich culture of diversity and equity. Developing a greater culture of excellence. Being responsible stewards of place. Think of that as the Central Coast. Most of these are familiar and stand alone, but I do want to expand on the last point. As you know, we've been working in economic development and quality of life for the last few years through partnerships with the city, county, chambers, REACH, and PG&E to mention a few. But I want to give credit to Executive Vice President and Provost Cynthia Jackson Elmore for elevating our steward of place, our own Central Coast, through partnerships with our community college partners. I'm pleased to say that we now have two two plus two programs. One is, with, is starting uh, with Hancock this fall in sociology, and I'm pleased, President Stearns is here, that we will be accepting applications uh, for one with teacher prep in mind, uh, applications for next fall. So let's pause and thank all our partners on the Central Coast as we look forward to growing our efforts to be stewards of place here on the Central Coast. There are two key objectives embedded in these strategic priorities that are worthy of more attention. They're essential to making everything else happen. Since Sharon and I first arrived at Cal Poly, when typically asked by a student or a faculty member or someone else, what keeps you up at night? I've focused on two points, and it's been the same every year. You know, you add COVID or you add this or add that. But the first has been making Cal Poly education available on equitable terms to more and more Californians and a more representative grouping. And I also add, it is so important that everyone here at the university have that sense of belonging. The second has been to improve compensation of our faculty and staff. Compensation that has not been adequate to the stature of our university or the cost of living in this area. I think it's clear to see that both of these have gone up over the past few years. So you've heard me say as well, and I know our academic senate and our staff and others know this to be true, we cannot have student success without faculty and staff success. Does that deserve an applause? In the distant past, we could count heavily on state resources to meet our challenges, but today is different. As we all know, the state has constraints and many competing interests vying for a share of the budget that's projected to be in deficit over the next few years. This situation is exacerbated by the CSU's tightening its budget, by asking universities to show that we're making efficient use of funds. Examples of this include reallocation of enrollment across the system, reallocation of enrollment funding across the system, shared services, procurement geared to take advantage of the size of our system and certainly the proposed integration of Cal Maritime and Cal Poly, which I will discuss in a, in a few more minutes. Collectively, this represents a great deal of change and uncertainty. However, I would stress that we focus on the positive, the opportunities. We have an amazing leader in Chancellor Mildred Garcia. She's fully behind our efforts to turn challenges into opportunities and grow. The key point is while there are many things beyond our control, we have much in front of us that will allow us to thrive 
things we can change. Of paramount importance is sustainable growth, as I mentioned. Given the multiple scenarios we face due to factors we cannot control, I would argue that growth is the factor that we can control and that will help us not just survive, but thrive. As I mentioned earlier, change the lives of more students and families. As we are a learn by doing residential campus with many high investment majors, year round operation is an indispensable component for future sustainable growth. Year round operation will allow equitable expansion of high impact practices such as undergraduate research, service learning, study abroad, and especially internships and hopefully more co-ops. Year-round year -round operation allows us to educate more students with the same facilities. This will allow us to grow while relieving pressure on housing on campus and in the community. As I explained in the note to the community this past spring, we are fortunate to be able to delay the start of year-round operation until the 27-28 academic year. In large part, this delay is due to efforts that have already increased enrollment. The measure for enrollment is resident full-time equivalent students. I'll refer to it as resident FTES. That's the coin of the realm, but think about it as more Californians serve. We have grown resident FTES faster than expected. To put our achievement in perspective, we added over 2,100 resident FTES over the last two years. One third of that came from headcount increase, while two thirds came from our students increasing their unit load and taking more classes. In fact, we met the CSU's resident FTES goal for this coming year, we're in, last year. We met the goal last year for this year. This increase in average unit load resulted from hiring 50 new tenure track faculty and identifying bottleneck courses. Second, we have continued to see growth in summer enrollment with typically 80% in a virtual modality. We also saw robust participation in summer courses by underrepresented minority and Pell eligible students. So now please think forward in time. Let's say we have students in the summer, fall or spring of 27, 28 and beyond. This means additional offering of courses, benefits to students and additional compensation to faculty who are teaching during that off term, which is not simply the summer at that time. We're continuing to bolster efforts uh, to increase class availability as well as the teacher scholar model. This is being done by hiring 67 tenure line colleagues for 24-25. Again, we're looking at sustainable growth. Growing average unit load summer, some head count while hiring faculty beyond the actual growth in students. As mentioned earlier, year-round operation will allow more students to participate in high-impact practices like internships, service learning, research, or study abroad, in part because of the greater flexibility offered by year-round operation schedule, and in part because of greater revenue through growth and contributions from donors. As I suggested several years ago, Perhaps it's time for a shared governance discussion about requiring one or more high impact uh, practices for all majors. Clearly results in greater success of our students. Our colleagues at Cal Maritime already do this. Some majors require three internships or co-ops with the minimum being one required internship per major. And yes, they do require senior projects. And I would point out that their placement rates and return on investment exceed those of Cal Poly. And we're both always in the top ranking. 
Finally, year-round operations should allow us to develop deeper partnerships with partner high schools, other high schools, such as Rex and Margaret Fortune Early College High School and the wonderful College Prep Academies. They're both, and many others, are continuing to send their outstanding students to Cal Poly, and we have an amazing group this fall. I would also add that our work with Fortune and several other key high schools in California and beyond are part of our overall strategy as part of the system-wide commitment to black student success. Year-round operation is not our only step to a more effective and efficient future. We're reviewing our IT environment, creating an office of effectiveness and efficiency, and established our Mustang Business Park, which will serve Maritime if approved by the Board of Trustees. Let's pause and give our colleagues who are at the Mustang Business Park a big round of applause. Before I discuss our last two topics, I want to address the academic calendar. The importance of year-round operation for high impact practices and growth resulted in our, our proposal last spring to reevaluate the previously agreed upon calendar of 15 week semesters and strongly consider a three symmetrical four week, uh, 14 week semesters. Let me get that out. Three 14 week semesters. Of course, faculty would only work two. The interval for this uh, feedback is open until mid-October. We look forward to, con uh, to receiving continued feedback. We're planning uh, for opportunities for the maritime faculty to also provide input on the proposed calendar uh, pre-integration as well. Again, uh, we don't know the outcome until November. And as I mentioned, let's come to maritime. Another important initiative pending approval by the CSU Board of Trustees will be the integration of Cal Poly and Cal Maritime. As president of Cal Poly, I view it as an honor and a responsibility to be asked to participate in this integration. I commend you as a faculty and staff for being open to this opportunity. As a brief reminder, the circumstances are that despite taking a significant cost saving action, Cal Maritime enrollment is significantly down and they cannot generate enough revenue relative to cost to sustain itself as an independent university. At the same time, Cal Maritime offers training and skills that are highly specialized, require very high investment and essential to the U.S. economy and national defense. The CSU recognizes the importance of maritime and the unique critical licensure degree programs that serve the workforce needs of the state of California, Pacific Rim states, and the nation's maritime industry. However, continuing on the current track is not an option because maritime simply cannot be sustainable as a standalone university. The solution proposed by the Chancellor's Office is to integrate Cal Poly and Cal Maritime. The Chancellor believes that many of Cal Poly's considerable strengths that I've outlined today uh, are complementary with Cal Maritime's. Uh, this also then presents synergistic opportunities that in the long run will benefit both institutions. Current and future uh, classes of increasingly diverse students, our state and our nation. Let me list a few reasons why I support this integration. First, the demand for Cal Poly admission and graduates and the high return on investment for Cal Poly and Cal Maritime are exceptional. We have demonstrated success with our financial aid and scholarship model that when applied to maritime will grow and uh, grow and enroll uh, grow enrollment i'll get it out and importantly allow us to see more historically underrepresented and low income students attend maritime maritime has a demographic base very similar to where we were several years ago 
we also share a pedagogical approach. While they haven't called it learn by doing, it has been hands on. There's also a significant number of overlapping majors with the majority being engineering. I also think it's clear that we can provide many uh, essential services, enrollment management, marketing, strategic uh, or human resources, financial services, information technology, and many others. Finally, of course, and I think most important, we gain the students. We gain the programs, a nationally recognized set of programs, the only maritime academy on the West Coast, and access to this 90-acre campus and to the training ship Golden Bear. We're also excited to note, and you'll see in the image, that a new training ship, U.S. training ship Golden State, is currently in production and will arrive fall of 26. The campus is also in the process of constructing a new pier. This complex will accommodate this new ship. Cal Maritime Interim President Dumont indicates that Golden State will be the largest building on campus with a capacity for 600 students and 100 faculty, staff, and crew. That is quite amazing. So I encourage everyone to review the material from the July Board of Trustees meeting, and there's recently posted materials for the September CSU Board of, Trust meeting, Board of Trustees meeting, which will be held next week. The board will vote on approval of the integration at the November meeting. One final topic concerns campus free speech. As you all know, last year was unusually contentious on university campuses. To provide clarity and consistency across the system, the CSU's Chancellor's Office recently completed a new time, place, and manner policy with each CSU university clarifying its campus-specific implementation of the policy in an addendum. Our addendum is available on the Dean of Students free speech website. There will also be a campus-wide communication on this topic later this week. I would also point out that this will result in very little change to our ongoing time, place, and manner policy. To put the situation simply, free speech is critical. As we have done in the past, we will protect the right of those to exercise free speech including lawful protests and demonstrations. At the same time, the rest of the university has the right to be able to function normally. We will enforce the laws and rules governing our campus. It's our responsibility as a university to protect free speech and at the same time assure the university follows time, place, and manner as well as other university policies. So in conclusion, a key part of our mission is to graduate more Californians in majors needed to drive our economy, and that is what Cal Poly does. We are now in a position to do this in a way that better serves the breadth of California's population and enhances learn by doing for students and the teacher-scholar model for faculty. Sustainable growth is essential for Cal Poly to achieve our strategic priorities and to deal with those two worries that can keep us all up at night. Let me end where I started and thank you all for choosing Cal Poly. Thank you very much for all you do and I wish you an amazing academic year and let's go Mustangs! I love this part. We get to celebrate some folks today. So, President Armstrong and uh, Vice, Vice President and Provost, Executive Vice President and Provost Cynthia Jackson Elmore will, jo will join us on stage. Um, before we get to honor 
folks and the award recipients, the provost and executive vice president will begin with some, mar some remarks. Before we start, um, before we start, oh, okay, <laughs> we're just gonna go with it. We were over here laughing um, because one of the things that Vice President Harris always done, does when he's about to introduce me is he goes, and this is my, right? And so when he was like tripped up, I was laughing because I'm like, he knows who I am. <laughs> He's just trying to navigate through everything. And, and I also want to say that it's an honor to do this part. It is also very humbling. Um, it's humbling, before we get started, it's humbling. I'm, I'm trying to help cue people if you wonder what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> it's humbling because you look at the work that people do. It's also because with someone with a name that doesn't seem complicated to say, but people often get it wrong. I know how important it is to get people's names right. And so I ask in advance for your patience. I have practiced. I have talked with all of the awardees. I am going to do my level best. And yet if I miss something, just charge it to the moment, not my heart at all. Um, but I think it's important to recognize that. And so now um, I want to also join my colleagues in thanking you for joining us today. I am so pleased to be able to officially begin our academic year with you. And today, again, I have the privilege of presenting awards to 13 exemplary members of our campus community for the 23-24 academic year. These individuals have been nominated by their peers and colleagues. And in the case of the Distinguished Teaching Award, and the Outstanding Faculty Advisor Award, their students. Thank you to everyone who took time to nominate someone for an award. It matters and it makes a difference. So we're gonna start with the Distinguished Scholarship Awards. We will begin with the Distinguished Scholarship Awards to really underscore the importance of what does it mean to be at a university. Yes, we teach. And yes, we do our scholarship, and the two go hand in hand. And sometimes they're presented as either or. That's not true. So the Distinguished Scholarship Awards recognize achievement in scholarship and creativity across the range of disciplines. They honor the work conducted primarily at Cal Poly and celebrate both exemplary specific accomplishments and outstanding bodies of achievement. Our three awardees will receive an award that reads, in recognition of your research, scholarship, and creative activities, contributions to knowledge and the student experience, mentoring, and your commitment to learn by doing. I also wanna advise you that when our recipients come up, they have to stand for a little while, help them feel comfortable while they're up here. So first, I would like to invite Dr. Tina Chuk to the stage. <laughs> Dr. Chuk's groundbreaking work in educational policy and teacher development has significantly elevated the profile of Cal Poly School of Education. A national authority in science education, Tina is one of 14 experts chosen, chosen to contribute to the National Academies of Sciences Pre-K through 12 STEM Education and Innovations Report. Her insights will help shape national recommendations for the U.S. Department of Education and other key agencies. At the state level, Tina played a pivotal role in California's literacy plan and bilingual authorization revision, impacting nearly six million students. Since joining Cal Poly in 2019, Tina has published 19 articles and edited a book on science education while also developing websites for significant initiatives such as teaching for inclusive and equity res residency data science for all, and the student parent joy. T 
Tina's dedication to diversity and equity in education is reflected in her innovative courses, Developing Teachers of Color, which was recognized by the California Council on Teacher Education. Through her research, teaching, and leadership, Tina has made a lasting impact on the field of education, teacher development, and STEM education, both at Cal Poly and beyond. Congratulations, Tina. <laughs> Next, I would like to invite Dr. Christina Furpa to the stage. Since joining Cal Poly in 2006, Dr. Ferber has earned international recognition for her work on race and gender in modern Vietnamese history. She has published 13 articles and two books, with a third book forthcoming, offering profound insights into topics like Franco-Vietnamese race relations, sex trafficking, and the shifting beauty of norms of Vietnamese women. Her first book, The Uprooted, Race, Imperialism, and Childhood in Indo Indochina, 1890 to 1990, received the prestigious Colleagues' Choice Book Award at the International Convention of Asian Scholars. This groundbreaking research revealed a secret colonial program in which Franco-Vietnamese mixed-race children were forcibly taken from their indigenous mothers. Her second book, Black Market Business, Selling Sex in North Vietnam, Vietnam, 1920 to 1945, uncovers over 2,000 cases of sex trafficking. Using innovative methodologies in historical research, she mapped networks operating at local, national, and international levels. In her latest book, Beauty and the Nation, Race, Capitalism, and my, my, I'm not gonna get this word out right, Modernity in Late Colonial Vietnam, she explores how women's beauty became a contested symbol of Vietnamese identity. For each of these projects, Christina assembled groups of student researchers, many from underserved populations. Her mentorship has enriched her students' academic experiences while contributing to the depth of her research. Congratulations, Christina. I would now like to invite Dr. Bing Q to the stage. And in case you're wondering, this is like my sixth go at that. I spoke at five college, com, com, college meetings this morning and now this, so I'm doing my best to hang in there. Since joining Cal Poly in 2008, Dr. Bing Q has established himself as a leading expert in earthquake engineering. His exceptional scholarship includes 65 papers and 32 refereed conference papers with over 2,250 citations. He is one of only five, one of only five engineers worldwide whose work is extensively cited in seismic provisions for structural steel buildings by the American Institute of Steel Construction. This is a critical guide for practicing engineers. His work on building bridges, crossing earthquake fault ruptures, led to the development of CSI Bridge, a software program used by thousands of engineering firms in over 160 countries. And yet there's more. <laughs> 
Bing's expertise is further recognized through his role as a reviewer for 47 academic journals, earning him seven reviewer awards. He also serves on the editorial board of six journals. His accolades include the prestigious Mosif Award from the American Societal for C Society for Civil Engineers, the Raytheon Excellence in Teaching and Applied Research Award also. His work has secured over half a million dollars in funding from organizations such as the National Science Foundation, the National Collegiate Inventors and Innovators Alliance, and Caltrans. In 2013, Bing received Cal Poly's Faculty Staff Appreciation Award for outstanding support of the Multicultural Engineering Program. He is committed to mentorship and involving students in his publications, particularly first-generation college students, students from a variety of backgrounds, and women in engineering. Congratulations, Bing. We have an amazing set of faculty. Congratulations and thank you to all of our distinguished scholarship awardees. We will now recognize the Distinguished Teaching Award recipient, which is based on nominations from students and alumni leaders. They will receive awards that read, in recognition of your excellence in teaching, contributions to student engagement and achievement, innovative instruction, and commitment to student success. And our first recipient, I would like to bring forward Dr. Kat Gillen. Students recognize Professor Kat, as she is affectionately referred to, as an outstanding teacher who continues to develop and improve her pedagogy from observing students during work time and attending professional development workshops to learn the latest techniques for her students. She understands that each class of students she gets will be different, and she adjusts her class structure to meet everyone where they are. One student nominator wrote, through her attitude and upbeat energy, physics becomes a welcoming place to explore and truly understand why the world around us functions as it does. Another wrote, what makes Dr. Cat unique is how she effectively addresses students who are struggling to approach them by approaching them with empathy and respect. Kat has chosen to dedicate her Distinguished Teaching Award to the memory of her late colleague, Dr. Joseph Kayanes Sloan. Joseph was an outstanding member of our Cal Poly community, serving as an associate professor in computer engineering department. He was known for his unwavering dedication to his students and his keen ability to make even the most complex concepts accessible and engaging. He made a profound impact on his students and colleagues through his kindness, empathy, and his passion for teaching. He was a dedicated mentor, guiding his students with patience and encouraging them to push beyond their limits. To honor his legacy, his family and colleagues created the Professor Joseph Kayanes Sloan Memorial Scholarship to help empower future leaders in computer engineering. Congratulations, Kat, and to Joseph's family, friends, and colleagues. Know that his contributions and impact will always be remembered at Cal Poly.
And before we call our next person, I just I want to pause for just a second in the weightiness that was just and ask you all to remember that special person that may be weighty for you and celebrate their life and their legacy. Because that's how we honor is when we celebrate the life and legacy and we carry it forward. I would now like to invite Eleanor Helms to the stage. In Professor Helms philosophy classes, students deeply appreciate her engaging and thoughtful teaching style. One student nominator said, Professor Helms creates an environment where everyone feels heard and encouraged to share their ideas. Another highlighted her ability to make complex topics accessible. She never just gives us the answers. Instead, she guides the conversation so we can discover the insights ourselves. Her approach has deepened my understanding of philosophy and made me more confident in my critical thinking. Her commitment to student success is evident, not just in her teaching, but in her willingness to go above and beyond. Why? To ensure that her students thrive. A student noted, Professor Helms has not only sparked my love for philosophy, but also inspired me to pursue it further in my studies. Her passion for teaching and genuine care for her students makes her one of the best professors I've ever had. Thank you for your contributions and congratulations. And now I would like to invite Dr. Terrence Stanko to the stage. In her management classes, Taryn is known for her engaging and thoughtful teaching style. One student described her class as, quote, the most personally impactful class I've ever taken. Taryn is a dedicated, genuine, and caring educator that takes the time to know each student's name within the first weeks of class. She arrives at every class, not well, exceptionally prepared, with students often likening her lectures to, quote, a TED talk with a smaller audience. Her courses have been transformative for many of her students, with one saying, Taryn has made me a better negotiator and businesswoman. She challenges students to go out of their comfort zone and grow as people. Another said that Taryn's classes mimic real world scenarios that prepare students for the future outside of the classroom. Thank you for your dedication, Taryn, and congratulations. I want to congratulate and say thank you again to all of our distinguished teaching awardees and the example that you set for us all. And now we will honor three of our staff members who will be recognized with outstanding staff awards that read, in recognition of your outstanding dedication, expertise, contributions, and teamwork. I would like to invite Rob Brewster to the stage.
Rob is regarded as an indispensable member of the Biological Sciences Department at the Bailey College of Science and Mathematics. His expertise in designing, building, and maintaining specialized equipment has been crucial to teaching and research. As one nominator put it, Rob delivers a Cadillac when you ask them for a Ford Fiesta. <laughs> A testament to the exceptional quality of his work, Rob helped construct Cal Poly's advanced aquarium system and tide simulator, which were instrumental in securing over $1.5 million in research funding. The system has enabled experiments resulting in multiple publications, including a recent poster presentation at a national research conference, which, check this, Rob co-authored. <laughs> Rob has elevated Cal Poly's reputation as a hub for cutting, uh, cutting edge, undergraduate-led research through learn by doing. Beyond his technical expertise, Rob serves as a mentor who patiently guides students and faculty through complex projects, making sophisticated technology accessible. Congratulations, Rob, on this recognition. I would like to invite Amy Hammond to the stage. <laughs> Amy's dedication to her team and innovative approach to leadership have, la have left a lasting impact on career services and across campus. Amy was instrumental in launching Cal Poly Career Connections a networking and mentoring pro platform that has created thousands of connections between students and alumni. She excels at reimagining programs for greater efficiency and encourages her team to explore new ideas. Her inclusive leadership fosters a culture where everyone's voice is heard. And she's known for acknowledging the hard work of her staff. As one colleague shared, Amy shines as a leader. She shows up and keeps her word. Amy is known for building strong relationships across campus, ensuring that students and staff alike feel valued. Congratulations on this recognition, Amy. And now I'd like to invite Albert Rangel to the stage. <laughs> For those who may not know, you will in a moment. That level of recognition and excitement is really important. And I know that it was shared for all of our awardees, but when I, when I give Albert's background, I think you, you will understand what I meant by that, because we have to recognize like all of the parts of the university, because it takes us all to do the really good work we do. Albert is being recognized for his exceptional contributions to university housing. Beginning as a temporary custodian in 2011, Albert rose through the ranks to his current role as Associate Director of Custodial Operations. <laughs> Albert, I know it's hard to, to stand there. I'm going to ask you to, to put your head up. All right, all right, there we go, there we go. 
A testament to his strong work ethic and passion for excellence, known for his hands-on leadership style, Albert works alongside his team, emphasizing mutual respect, teamwork, and active involvement. His willingness to support and mentor others, whether by training staff on new equipment or providing guidance in challenging situations has earned him the trust of his colleagues. One colleague shared that Albert's approachable, open demeanor makes him a go-to person for advice and support. And he actively engages with students to understand and address their needs. Albert's dedication to the department and the students it serves has been a mainstay of his career and his leadership continues to inspire those around him. Congratulations, Albert, on this recognition. And as we congratulate and thank again all three of our outstanding staff awardees who again are the tip of the iceberg of our amazing staff, I actually want to thank everyone seated in here for the warm welcome that you gave to Albert in particular, but everyone, and I'm making that point because it's our unseen and unsung heroes, right? We will now announce the Outstanding Faculty Advisor Award, which reads, in recognition of your contribution to student success through academic advising, mentoring, and career guidance to help build real world skills. I would like to invite Dr. Leslie Nelson to the stage. As a mentor, advisor, and advocate, Leslie exemplifies the transformative role that faculty can play in shaping the future of students. The nomination submitted on her behalf paints a clear picture of this. One student, reflecting on their senior project experience, shared the following. Dr. Nelson was committed, supportive, attentive to details, and guided me through every step of the way. She gave me autonomy, but had high expectations, exactly the kind of mentorship I needed. Another student shared, Dr. Nelson has been so supportive of not only me, but of amplifying marginalized voices. She never wants to speak for a particular group, but instead gives people like me a place to be heard. Many students highlighted her balance of academic rigor with personal care. One said, Dr. Nelson genuinely was genuinely interested in my success, not just as a student, but as a person. When I was struggling with meeting a deadline, she made accommodations to ensure my project could be completed accurately and thoroughly. Her support truly made a difference. Congratulations, Leslie. And now we will honor the recipient of the Provost Leadership Award for Partnership in Philanthropy, which recognizes a visionary leader who forged critical partnerships to advance the mission of Cal Poly. I would like to call to the stage Dr. Zhang Wu. As a department head of construction management 
in the College of Architecture and Environmental Design, Zhang has cultivated meaningful relationships with alumni, donors, and industry partners, bringing critical resources to our institution and building a unique culture of philanthropy. Over the past five years, his leadership has resulted in contributions that accounted for nearly 50% of the total donations to the college. <laughs> Faculty support has been one of the highest priorities of his fundraising goals. Through targeted campaigns, he raised $1 million for a faculty professional professor, faculty professorship, that's the word, endowment this year alone. Additionally, he initiated a campaign to establish an endowment supporting faculty research activities and expanded the construction management dis discretionary fund to allocate over $80,000 annually toward faculty development activities. With these endowments, we have advanced research, enhanced learning opportunities, and attracted top-tier educators. His accomplishments include numerous facility improvement projects that have enriched the learning environment for students and faculty, such as the Pacific Structures Concrete Lab, the Day Matei Student Lounge, the Classroom AV System upgrades as well. Through initiatives such as the Women in Construction Fund and scholarships for first-generation students, he ensured that opportunities at Cal Poly are available to all, regardless of background. Congratulations, Zhang. Oh, don't go too far. You know I'm getting ready to call you back up, right? <laughs> We're going to recognize and congratulate the recipients of the Learn by Doing Scholars Award, which recognizes faculty contributions to Cal Poly's signature Learn by Doing pedagogy. And our recipients, of which there are three that I would ask to come to the stage, is Dr. Zhang Wu, Dr. Jacques Bellingy, and Dr. Joseph Cleary. <laughs> These three scholars are being recognized for their work on the project Skip the Grid an interdisciplinary community service project that aims to positively impact the Navajo Nation by providing off-grid solar energy to families of school-aged children living with ele without electricity. Now in its third year, Skip the Grid has evolved into a model of experiential learning. Over the past three years, 54 students from five of Cal Poly's six colleges, supported by five dedicated faculty members, have organized, planned, designed, and installed reliable solar photovoltaic systems. This project, you can clap. <laughs> this project immerses students in real-world challenges, leadership opportunities, and hands-on experience that defines a Cal Poly education. To prepare for the installation, students participated in an extensive education and training program, which included cultural sensitivity training and comprehensive technical instruction. For more than two months, they collaborated shared progress, and refined their skills. From understanding optimal solo orientation to inspecting roofs and connecting the systems, 
students learned every step of the process, culminating in the installation of solar panels and the delivery of reliable energy to 62 homes. Each year, this project builds on the lessons and challenges of the previous year, leading to greater efficiency, deeper understanding, and more impactful outcomes. By partnering with Solve Energy, industry leaders, community supporters, and Heart of America, the nonprofit that connects the project to families, Skip the Grid exemplifies the level of professional coordination expected in the renewable energy industry. Students participating in this project are acquiring the skills, confidence, and interdisciplinary perspective that will set them apart as they enter their careers. They are truly learning by doing, and as a result, they are making a meaningful difference in the lives of others. Congratulations again to our Learn By Doing Scholar Awardees. That concludes the awards portion of our ceremony today. We are fortunate to have so many talented individuals with us at Cal Poly. Congratulations again to all of our awardees and thank you to the award committee members for their work. And I wanna thank everyone for the work you do and the way that you show up for us here at Cal Poly. Enjoy the rest of your day. Wow, I say it again, we are surrounded by incredible people, huh? What an impressive group of award winners. Let's congratulate our faculty and staff award winners one more time. Let me, let me see if I can get this right, and how about we say thank you to my provost and executive vice president, Cynthia Jackson Elmore. And let's also thank the many, many uh, team members who you often don't see who do a lot of hard work to make sure that a day like today goes off and that we all get to enjoy ourselves. So thank you to all those who've put in the hard work. As we, as we conclude the general session of convocation and begin the new academic year, let's remember to embrace the power of learn by doing demonstrate gratitude, and take good care of our health and well-being. Be conscientious collaborators and continue to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion. Thank you all for being here. And now it's time for the after party. I mean, and please head to the lobby for our reception and enjoy the refreshments and the company of our Cal Poly community. Happy Academic New Year!